So guys, over the past few months, I've been doing these monthly portfolio review videos where I take a look at some of your holdings and offer my honest feedback. But this month, we're gonna switch things up and I'm gonna turn the spotlight on my own portfolio. In this video, we're gonna go through my entire dividend stock portfolio and as objectively as I can, I'm gonna share the good, share the bad, and give it an honest and thorough review. Now guys, just a little bit of background info. At this point in time, I've been investing for probably around four and a half years or so. And if we take a look at my dividend portfolio, portfolio tracking spreadsheet, which you can start using for free. There is a link to download this spreadsheet in the description of the video. But here we are looking at the monthly data tab, which is essentially where I input all of the monthly data for my portfolio, whether it's the market value or the monthly contributions, everything goes on this page. And I've been tracking this ever since I started investing. And we can see here at the top, I started making regular contributions to my portfolio back in February of 2020. And with that, I started making videos about investing here on the channel around four years ago. We're coming up on four years. I started posting videos in October of 2020. And when I first started, you can go back and see this in my earliest videos. I wasn't 100% into dividend investing. I actually had a decent amount of growth stocks in my portfolio. Looking at my history from Charles Schwab, I had stocks like Virgin Galactic, Beyond Meat, I had Dropbox, and I even had one of the ARK ETFs. So as you can see, the strategy then, I don't even know if there was a strategy, but what I was doing then was quite a bit different than what I'm doing now. And I don't even know exactly how I found out about dividend investing, but somehow I started watching guys like PPC Ian, The Dream Green Show, JJ Buckner, my man Russ, Gen X Dividend Investor, and a handful of other great creators in the dividend investing space, all of which I still watch today. And it's actually kind of cool because now I'm, I'm friends with a lot of these guys, which is a very surreal thing. But anyway, watching all of these guys in the dividend investing space really put me on the path to start getting into dividend investing. Once I learned more about dividend investing from watching these guys, it really resonated with me. I loved the idea of collecting a passive paycheck from these companies. I love that that part of the return wasn't dependent on the stock share price. And I love that someday down the road, I wouldn't have to sell my shares in order to benefit from that investment. Overall, it was just a much more straightforward approach to investing for me. It was like, you know, you just buy stocks, you know, collect the dividend income, reinvest it, and build that up until the point where your dividend income is able to cover your expenses. And then at that point, you're pretty much good to go. And I've got to say, guys, I love dividend investing just as much today as I did when I first got into it, probably even more. You know, like I said, I've been doing this now for about four and a half years, and it's only been recently that I feel like I'm starting to come into my own as an investor. And it's only until recently that I feel like a lot of this stuff is starting to click. It took a few years, obviously, you know, it's four and a half years, but these last few years have been a really big learning experience. I still have a lot to learn, don't get me wrong, but I do feel like I've learned a lot in the four and a half years that I've been doing this. And, you know, today compared to when I first started, I feel so much more comfortable and confident in what I'm doing. And I'm also really stoked about how the portfolio is coming along. Going back over here to my spreadsheet, looking at the dashboard page for my main taxable brokerage account on Charles Schwab, we can see this is currently valued at almost $65,000, which is not too shabby. And looking at the dividend stats, this portfolio has a near 4% dividend yield with an 8.3% dividend growth rate. I really like these dividend stats. I think this really gives me the best of both worlds. But anyway, looking at the dividend income breakdown every single year, this account is generating $2,557 of dividend income, which amounts to about $213 every single month, almost $50 per week, and just over $7 per day. Now, if we take a quick gander over at the positions in this account, we can see that it's made up solely of individual companies. While by nature, dividend investing is a buy and hold strategy, and it is passive in that way, I am taking more of an active approach with with that account in the sense that I am handpicking, you know, researching and handpicking all of the different stocks that I choose to invest in in that account. And that type of active approach is in contrast to what's going on in my Roth IRA retirement account, which I keep over on M1 Finance. Now, just a little background on this account here. It's currently valued at about $11,900. It's been making some really great strides this year, but looking at the dividend stats, we'll see that the yield is a little bit lower. We're rocking a near 2.6% dividend yield and a near 9.5% dividend growth rate. So these are gonna be your classic dividend growth stats right here. And looking at the dividend income breakdown, this account is generating just over $300 every single year, which breaks down to almost $26 per month, almost $6 per week, and almost $1 per day. We're
we're getting there. And like I was saying a moment ago, as opposed to my taxable account, this one is much more passive. We can see that I only have two different holdings in here. Both of them are ETFs. We have SCHD and VU. And every single week, I'm just dollar cost averaging into both of those ETFs. Rain or shine, no matter whether they're up and down, I'm investing $130 per week into this account, which gets divvied up between these two funds. And my goal, guys, by the end of the year, I have mentioned this before in other videos, but my goal by the end of the year is to reach 100 shares of SCHD by January of next year. And you know, we're 13 and a half shares away. We will definitely get there. And now before we get into all of the individual holdings within my portfolio between these two accounts, I first wanna show you a breakdown of how this portfolio is diversified by low and high yielding dividend stocks, as well as stocks with low and high dividend growth rates. And starting with the diversification by dividend yield here, we can see that this portfolio is pretty well split between low to moderate yielding stocks as well as higher yielding stocks. And I personally consider anything above about a 4% dividend yield to be on the higher end. Some of you guys might have a different threshold for that, but that's what I'm rocking with. And we can see that between the low to moderate yielding stocks, you know, zero to 4%, there are 10 different holdings, whereas the high yielding stocks, there's nine different holdings. So it's a near 50-50 split between these two. And if we look at the top five highest yielding stocks in my portfolio, right at the top there, we have Owl Rock Capital Corporation, which at the time recording is rocking a 12 and a quarter percent dividend yield, but this is not a huge position of mine at all. ORCC only makes up about 2.2% of the portfolio's total weighting. And then in second place, guys, we have Main Street Capital Corporation. Both of these top two are business development companies, but Main Street's yield is coming in at 8.44%. And this is a little bit bigger of a position in the portfolio. It makes up 3.6% of the total weighting. And then my third highest yielding stock is going to be Altria Group over there in the consumer staples sector. Altria has a 7.2%. 0.66% dividend yield, so definitely juicy. And this makes up 3.72% of my overall portfolio. Moving on, my fourth highest yielding stock is gonna be EPD Enterprise Products Partners with a 7.27% dividend yield, not too shabby. And so far with the four stocks that we've looked at, this one has the heaviest weighting and it comes in at about four and a quarter percent of the overall portfolio. And then my fifth highest yielding stock is gonna be Kilroy Realty Corporation, KRC, which is currently rocking a 6.5% dividend yield, which is great. And this currently makes up 3.36% of my portfolio's total weighting. And then when we combine all of these weightings, the top five highest yielding stocks in my portfolio make up just about 17% of the portfolio's total weighting, which is not a huge and heavy allocation. And now if we switch gears and see the breakdown between low and high dividend growth stocks, we can see that Eight out of my 19 stocks have a dividend growth rate, a five-year dividend growth rate that is 5% or below, which is definitely on the lower side. Some of those are gonna be the higher yielding stocks in my portfolio for sure. Moving on, we can see that I have six different holdings with dividend growth rates that are pretty moderate, somewhere between five and 10%. And then last but not least, I have five different holdings with dividend growth rates at 10% or above. So five dividend growth monsters. I would even say that some of those in the five to 10% range are pretty growthy as well. Like once you get up to, I would say, say like an eight or 9% dividend growth CAG, or I would consider that to be you know, higher on the growth side for sure. And I'd be happy with that. But anyway, now taking a look at my top five highest dividend growth stocks, and this is by the dividend growth CAGRs. And right there at the top, we have William Sonoma with a 17.46% five-year dividend growth CAGR, which is awesome, guys. Really great dividend growth stock. And this is a heavy position in my portfolio. William Sonoma makes up 6.6% of the total weighting. Moving on, in second place, we have Lowe's, and this one's actually tied for first place. So Lowe's also has a 17.46% dividend growth rate, and this is also a little bit of a heavier position at 5.12% of the total weighting. Moving on, the next highest dividend growth CAGR is going to come from Visa, who has a 15.77% dividend growth rate. And this is the heaviest position that we've looked at so far, making up 7.6% of the portfolio's total weighting. Next up though, guys, we have Snap-on, which is coming in hot with a 14.4% dividend growth rate. Really nice. Snap-on is one of my favorite dividend growth stocks, actually. And it's not a huge position of mine. I wish I had a higher weighting, but it makes up three, almost three and a quarter percent of the total portfolio. And then guys, the heaviest position so far is SC. HD with a 12.88% dividend growth CAGR, and this makes up 9.2% of the portfolio's total weighting. And over time, you know, like I said, I'm adding to SCHD every single week in the Roth IRA. Over time, this will become 
a, a really big position. Like it wouldn't surprise me at some point to see SCHD become 20 to maybe even 30% of the total portfolio. But anyway, when we combine all of these weightings, guys, the top five highest dividend growth stocks and ETFs make up a combined 32% of my total portfolio. So as we can see, my portfolio is much more heavily skewed toward dividend growth stocks, which is perfect. I've worked hard to get it that way. It wasn't always that way, but this is exactly how it should be considering my investment time horizon. I'm only 31 years old. But still, I think I have a really solid mix of everything in this portfolio. I've clearly got some high yielding stocks, so I get you know that current income. I can juice that a little bit. I've also got some really solid dividend growth stocks. You know, we've got those high dividend growth categories. We can check that off. And then I also have some stocks that are you know in between. I've got those steady, stalwart, sleep well at night stocks that also make up a good chunk of my portfolio. So overall, I've got a little bit of everything. And I think just having that balance is how I'm able to have the dividend stats that I do where I'm able to benefit from a yield that's a little bit on the higher end, you know, about three and three quarters of a percent across my entire portfolio with that still nice and respectable dividend growth rate, you know, just below 9%. So overall, I'm happy. But anyway, guys, now let's take a deeper look into my portfolio and see how it's diversified by sector. And to do this, we'll be using Snowball Analytics, which is this tool here. And Snowball Analytics has quickly become one of my favorite portfolio trackers to use. I've been rocking with this for a little while now. And like I said, it's just just, it's a beast, guys. It has so many bells and whistles. It's got like more features than you know what to do with. But I highly recommend you guys check it out. I think you'll really like it. And if you want to do that, there's a link to it in the description of the video. I'll also put one in the pinned comment. You can try Snowball Analytics out for two weeks free with their 14 day trial, but definitely check it out. Now getting back to it, guys, looking at the diversification by sector, right here at the top, we can see the consumer discretionary makes up the largest portion of my portfolio with a 21 and a quarter percent allocation. And if we zoom in and take a look at all of the individual holdings, I have three different stocks in the sector. I have Starbucks, which is far and away the largest position in my portfolio right now due to their recent run up. So Starbucks is my largest position. That's numero uno. We also have William Sonoma in this sector as well. And then I also have Lowe's. Moving on, my second largest sector is gonna be real estate, making up 18.33% of the total portfolio. And I have four different real estate stocks in my portfolio. I have Realty Income, Beachy Properties, Kilroy Realty Corporation, KRC, and then WP Carry. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in just a moment. But then next up, we have of the ETFs, the funds here, which make up 15.5% of the total portfolio. And we already know these are the ones in my Roth IRA, it's SCHD and VU. But then guys, the fourth largest sector is gonna be financials, making up near 13.5%. And if we take a look at those holdings, it's gonna be the two highest yielders in my portfolio, the BDCs, Main Street Capital Corporation and Blue Owl Capital Corporation. And then I also have Visa, which as we saw was one of the highest dividend growth stocks in my portfolio. And Visa, once again, is, is one of my relatively larger positions. But then guys, moving on, my fifth largest largest sector is gonna be healthcare, making up 10% of the portfolio. And I only have two different stocks in here. I have Johnson & Johnson, which is a big position of mine, and AbbVie, which I wish was a bigger position of mine because it's done very stinking well for me. But anyway, then in sixth place, we have Consumer Staples, which makes up just under 10% of the portfolio. And there was a period of time where this was much larger. There was a period where Consumer Staples was near like 25% of my portfolio's total weighting. And if we dive in here, I only have two stocks. I have Procter & Gamble and Altree Group in this sector. I used to have a, I think maybe just one more. I had Campbell's Soup at one point in time and I don't remember if I've ever had any other consumer staples stock. Oh, I had Coca-Cola, how could I forget that? Anyway guys, then the second to last largest sector for me is gonna be energy, making up 8% of the total portfolio. And if we look at the holdings here, it's just two different stocks. It's EPD, Enterprise Products Partners, which was one of my highest yielding stocks, and we have Chevron here. But anyway guys, then my smallest sector is gonna be industrials. It only makes up three and a quarter percent of the total portfolio. It's because I only have one stock, and that industrial stock is gonna be Snap-on. There's a handful of other industrials that I've had in my eye on. We'll take a look at that a bit later in the video, but I just haven't had the opportunity to pull the trigger on them. But I really like the industrial sector. I think that there's a lot of room to diversify just within this sector. There are so many different industries that you can invest into just in this one sector here. And I think that's a that's a really exciting thing. And like I said, there's a couple different stocks, a handful of stocks that I think are really cool in this sector that at some point I wouldn't mind adding to. But anyway, guys, that's gonna be my portfolio in a nutshell. And now just giving you some of my thoughts on the good and bad aspects of the portfolio, starting with the good, you know, starting with the good stuff. 
I will say that one thing that I really appreciate and really like about this portfolio is the balance there in the dividend stats, as I mentioned earlier. Just to reiterate once again, I think there's a really solid balance here between high-ish yield, like that's a pretty respectable dividend yield right there. And when you pair that with an 8.5% dividend growth rate, I think you've got double trouble in the dividend department. And with that, guys, I'm also very happy with the returns that I've seen in this portfolio. I think for the most part, I've done pretty well with my entry into the positions that I have in this portfolio. And what we're looking at here is the total return. So this includes dividends and share price appreciation. And looking at the only losers that I currently own, I mean, WP Carry is down the most, you know, just looking at the total return or the total loss, it's 4.1%, which is really not bad at all. And if we jump back over to my spreadsheet, looking at all of my sold positions over the years, I've done pretty well here as well. I, you know, across the board, my total return is about $1,400 from all of these positions. It's not all been good. You know, I haven't made money on every single investment. I've definitely lost some money on a few of them as we can see here. But you know, when you add it all together, I'm still in the green, including dividends. So, you know, I've done pretty well and I'm happy about that. And I didn't really touch on this earlier, but I'm also very happy with the number of holdings that I have in my portfolio. And I've worked very hard, especially over this last year to consolidate the number of positions in my portfolio. In the last year, I've gone from 27 different holdings down to 19 holdings, which is where I'm at now. And that's been a lot more manageable. I feel like that's a much more streamlined way to go about things. And I still think that there's room for me to continue trimming a bit more, which brings us to the next thing that we should talk about, which is the ways that this portfolio can be improved. Probably the easiest way for me to continue this consolidation and continue streamlining things in the portfolio would be to remove some of my real estate holdings here. And if we go back in once again, I do think four different real estate stocks is a bit much for me. Ideally, I'd like to narrow this down to two different real estate investment trusts. And ideally I would like that to just be realty income and Vichy properties out of the ones that I currently own. And with that said, that is nothing against Kilroy Realty Corporation and WP Carey. I'm not quite ready to sell out of these because I do think that I will end up seeing a really solid return with both of these. I just, I think it's gonna take a little bit of time. And in the meantime, I'm still generating ample dividends from these two. So I'm not in that much of a rush to sell them, but that is something that I would like to do at some point, just in my attempt to continue consolidating is narrow this down to just two different REITs. I think that's gonna be a lot better. But anyway, outside of consolidating in those couple of areas, I'm very happy with how this portfolio is shaping up. I mean, it's really come a long way and I'm, I'm very happy with where it's currently at. And so with that, I really don't plan to make any drastic changes to this portfolio. Moving forward, my only big plans would be to try and find the best possible additions to the portfolio. And if we take a look at my watch list, this is the companies that I want to buy. I am for sure that I will be adding these companies at some point. The only one on this list right now is Rollins. You guys know I've been, I've been hunting this one down. I've been really wanting to add this to the portfolio for some time, but the timing is just not quite right. I'm trying to stay patient with this one. I think I will have my day with it, but you know, it's not gonna happen overnight. But at some point, I'll be adding this to the portfolio. And then I also have this other watch list of companies that I might want to buy. And these are all of the stocks that I think are interesting, but I still need to do some more research into them to determine if they're ones that I do 100% want to buy. And you can see that there's a handful more companies on this list than the previous one. And then if we look at the dividend stats on all these companies, as we can see here in this column, all of these are dividend growth monsters. I mean, the one with the lowest dividend growth CAGR is gonna be Republic Services, RSG here, who has a dividend growth rate of about 7.4%, which is still pretty respectable. But, you know, as you can see, some of these dividend growth rates are definitely getting up there. Old Dominion, over th almost 36%. Sintas Group, 22.3%. Zoetis with a 22% dividend growth CAGR. So yeah, guys, all of these here are just complete dividend growth monsters. And speaking of dividend growth monsters, in this next video right over here, I'm telling you about a big mistake that I made with a particular dividend growth monster. It's not good guys, but you know, mistakes are bound to happen and it's all just part of the learning experience. But anyway, click right over here to find out what happened and I'll see you in the next one.